Good morning. Good morning. All right. How are we doing today? Oh, sleepy. <laughs> your your commitment to your family and to your business to be here with us this morning. Yes. Thank you. All right. How you doing, Marinelli? I'm doing all right. Um, <laughs> I. We terminated that contract uh, with my buyer yesterday. Um, he unfortunately spoke with his lender and uh, and decided that um, he wanted to spend less per month. So we're starting to start again. All right. Anything yeah. come of that um, at listing to your neighbor? Um, which I'm I'm sorry. Uh, the About the um, the guy wanting having somebody to that he already knew or yeah no no nothing there okay um and did you get my message um on devro downs on i did um let me take a closer look at it the first thing this morning i'm sorry okay. thanks uh, andrew did you get that worked out yesterday i did thank you thanks for your help. all right hey everybody Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, I want to spend um, a little bit of time today uh, reviewing a couple of my favorite chart master slides. We kind of zoomed through it a little bit yesterday um, on the basic skills, uh, but it looks like we have some new faces uh, here on this call and also want to um, give you guys a little bit more uh, time to interact with uh, some of the material I want to share and um, for you to, number one, understand it yourself, but maybe even more importantly, to be able to explain it to your consumer, um, not just in kind of lecture form, like here's a sheet of paper, I wanna tell you what it means. And I want you to sit there and listen, right? It's the kind of thing that says, here's a third party evaluation of some of the data in the marketplace right now. What do you think about this? Let's talk about it, right? Because um, as we know, oftentimes, if the ultimately the client is the one that comes up with these ideas, then it's a lot more impactful when you try to share the idea or make them have the idea. Make sense? All right, beautiful. All right, Liz, eyes on the road. You need, you need the camera like right there in front of you. Okay. Let's start with who has some good news. Let, let, I don't want to forget that. It's, it's, an, it's impossible to be grateful and stressed at the same time. So let's talk about how we're feeling grateful. I am grateful for sticking to a lead that I received from Michelle Slater, who yeah. at the time before the pandemic or during the pandemic, she was a school teacher, didn't know if she was gonna have a job, um, then decided that she wanted to stay and finish out the year for her daughter since it's her eighth grade year, which I understood. Um, so I said, okay, I'll continue reaching out. So she reached out to me yesterday and said, well, since we're going into digital learning, there's no need for us to stay where we're staying. We're gonna move forward and buy property. So nice. now I'm moving forward with that buyer saying. Good job. Beautiful. Good job. And by the way, even if they were to say, hey, it's not, a, it's not the right time for me uh, to move for if you had gotten the complete opposite reaction, right? Your job right. is to add people to your database and communicate with them systematically, right? Exactly. And um, if, they, if your reaction to them saying that is well, uh, you know, I'm just going to go focus on somebody who's ready to buy now, right? Then right. Um, that doesn't leave a good taste in their mouth, right? Hey, Ebony. Right. Um, however, when you respond in a way that acknowledges that you're in, you're concerned with what they're concerned with, right? Then not mm -hmm. only do you increase your chances for for recommendations and referrals, right? Um, you also increase your trust and deepen that relationship. Correct. Right. By the way, I want to, I, I think I've said this a couple of times, but I'll, I'll say one extra thing, which is, you know, ref, the word referrals is, is somewhat of an internal term, right? So like if Kathy and I are talking about, you know, oh, did you get a referral from somewhere or how'd you find that piece of business? Oh, I got it from a referral. When you use mm -hmm. the word referral with your customers or your clients or your prospects, it seems, uh, it, 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 it doesn't carry quite as much weight. A better, a better phrase to use is a connection. Right. Mm -hmm. Would you mind introducing me or introduction or would you mind connecting me with this person? Not would you mind referring me to them? 
You see what I'm saying? Right. Make it a little bit more personal. Awesome. Great job. Who else uh, wants to share some good news? I guess I'll go. Go ahead. So uh, today, I guess after I get off this call, before it rains, um, I'm going up to one of my friend's neighbor's house that had listed their house with and with uh, with a realtor, and I guess they had a bad experience because they fired him. But um, so I'm I'm going to go up and try to see if they'll let me list with them. Beautiful. Can I give you some Can I give you some advice on that? Yes, please. <laughs> Who's the loud guy? Okay, um, here's my take on that. There, there is a lot, a lot of lessons to be learned from whatever happened prior to you coming in that door. Exactly. Okay. So make sure you're asking the questions about, you know, let's give the guy credit or the woman credit, right? What did you, what did that realtor do that you really liked? Right? What did that realtor do that you really, you know, didn't like? Or what do you wish the realtor would have done that they didn't do, right? How would you best like to be communicated with, right? What do you want, what do you expect your realtor to do for you, right? These are all questions that are gonna help you understand how to service that person better and in the way that they want to be serviced, right? And if by chance, I mean, who knows, there could be a chance that that person has crazy expectations and that realtor you know, went above and beyond and just still couldn't satisfy that, you know, this prospect or this seller. I don't know if that's the case or not, but we have to find out, right? So if you ask them, you know, what do you expect from your agent? And they're like, well, I expect him to be at every single showing. I want feedback within 20 minutes, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I want to price the home a hundred grand more than it's worth. Yeah, you'd probably bail on that. But if they have reasonable expectations, then you just need to find out how they want to be serviced and then give it to them, right? They'll give you the playbook. This is what you do if you want to make me happy. This is what you do if, if you want to piss me off, right? See what I'm saying? Yeah. Beautiful. Go up there with the paperwork, man. Go in, go in there and assume you got the sale. Okay. Okay. We'll do. Right. Yeah. Ask them what yeah I, um... You know, don't forget the motivation questions. Ask them why they're moving, why it's important to them, what happens in their life when they get that. And then you become the person that's going to solve all those problems. Okay. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. Well, um, well, I know that they, <clears throat> they have already moved to Florida and, um, I, I know that they, uh, that the agent apparently was kind of lazy and didn't do any, um, I guess like the open houses and stuff like that. So maybe there was some stuff along the lines where they thought, I guess he didn't work hard enough or just didn't do anything at all. Um, there was a couple of photos on Zillow that were, really bad and look like they didn't really use a good photographer maybe so so don't say hey those pictures were bad i'm going to take better pictures right say i'm going to be using a professional photographer to make sure the pictures look fantastic right just keep it positive yeah. and focus on what you're doing okay right? make sense Thanks. and oftentimes we do a lot of stuff yet we forget to tell our people what we're doing right so for example, if I take a listing, I get great pictures. I price the home perfectly. The home sells like this. The home's in great shape because I helped them get it in great shape. So the inspection stuff is relatively minuscule. And then I, next time I see them is at the closing table and I pick up a check for 10 grand. They're like, oh my gosh, that guy's way overpaid. But what I forgot to tell them is all the stuff that I did for them when they weren't paying attention. So don't be afraid to tell these people what you're doing for them, right? Hey, by the way, I put your home on uh, KWLS today and it's now live on 10,000 websites, right? Hey, I, I boosted a post on Facebook. You don't have to tell them what it only costs five bucks, but we got 12,000 impressions. Is there anything else you want me to do for you today? You see what I'm saying? All right, beautiful. I just want to look, tell you one thing I'm noticing about the numbers so far in June First of all, we are, uh, the ratio of held appointments to set, set appointments is the best it's ever been, okay? So we're, we're setting appointments, and I'm guessing that you guys are getting more comfortable and more um, uh, straightforward about the value you intend to bring on that appointment. And as a result, 
um, it appears like your people are holding those appointments at a, at a better ratio than they have since we started this program. So I just want to make sure that I, I point that out and I recognize you guys for your, for your extra efforts on that. Life is just a lot easier when more, more of your appointments that you work hard to set show up. Does everyone agree with that? Okay, yeah. I'm also noticing that a higher percentage of your appointments are listing appointments. So I wanna congratulate you on that too. We know that when you have a well-priced, pretty listing, you're gonna get lots of sign calls and lots of opportunity to turn those inquiries into future buyers and future sellers. So um, uh, the more you can lean towards the seller side of the business, the more leveraged you're gonna feel your business is and the more freedom you're gonna feel over your time. So uh, half of our appointments month to date have been listing appointments. Um, we have not really been close to that lately in the last several months. So I just wanna point that out too. Congratulations on that. All right. Anyone else want to share anything? All right, I'm going to hop right into some um, screen sharing stuff with the um, chart masters. Would do people find this to be helpful? Do you guys want to spend a minute on chart masters? Yes. yes. Okay. Hang on one second. Okay, don't forget we moved the all session, all group session uh, tomorrow, or I'm sorry, Thursday. Uh, we moved that session to 12 o'clock, 12 to one o'clock, so that we can uh, accommodate a uh, Andy and Leslie's chart masters class from two to four. The two to four chart masters class, remember, is a different link. The link is in the, um, in the newsletter, okay? All right, so I'm just gonna kind of uh, go through a couple of these slides. If, I, if it was me, these are probably the slides that I look for every single time that the chart master's data comes out. And these are the slides that I would print out in color and have in my back pocket when I'm meeting with prospects, okay? Buyers or sellers, okay? Now, um, the reason why we wanna do this, number one, is because there's a difference between a client receiver, a prospect receiving um, uh, your opinion and even though your opinion may be rooted in fact, it likely is, and the evidence of factual, this is a review of real data, and it's right here in front of us, what do we think about this together? Does that make sense? Do y'all see that, that nuance? Okay, so um, what I wanna do, please move this window away from the screen. What does that mean? Can y'all see that clearly? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, by the way, please don't print off an 80 page chart master's packet and expect the prospect to sit through that presentation. Okay, just hit them with the highlights. In my opinion, these are the highlights, okay? This is what happens when the home does or does not need a price reduction, okay? By price range, median. Median is when you take all the data, you line it up from lowest to highest, and the one in the middle, one in the middle. So that is different from average, okay? So this is telling us that red, the red bar is no price reduction, the gray bar is a price reduction. So in, on uh, the entire Atlanta market, all the price ranges, if the home is priced correctly on day one, it will sell for 100% of list price. Therefore, it does not need a price reduction to go under contract and to sell. If the home does need a price reduction to sell or to go under contract, it's going to sell for 93.6% median. Okay, that's a 6.5% difference simply by pricing the home correctly. Okay, that's significant money. That could be close to $20,000 if you're, you know, you know, kind of middle of the road Roswell area property. Okay. And it breaks it down by price range. So if you're sitting in front of a uh, $180,000 uh, seller, if they miss on the price or you allow them to miss on the price, you could cost them, you know, fifteen dollars to $20,000 right here. It's almost a nine point spread. Do y'all see that? What about a million and a half seller? That's a thir almost 14% spread, guys. No, I'm sorry. That is a almost a 10% spread. Do y'all see that? 
So this is what happens if they do not need a price reduction and what happens if they do need a price reduction. The data is also very clear in the number of days that that home would be on the market. Okay, number of days the home on the market, red again is if they do not need a price reduction, gray is if they do. So let's just say we're looking at a three hundred dollars to $500,000 property, you know, what we might find in the general Roswell area. If they price it correctly, they're on the market for 10 days. If they price it incorrectly, 102 days. So let me ask you a question, Mr. Seller. Would you rather make your bed and clean your kitchen and wipe off all your shelves and put away all your shoes and blah, 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 blah for 102 days? Or would you prefer it to do it for 10 days? And let me ask you guys a question as an agent. Would you rather give feedback once or twice during the listing period? Or would you rather dread making that phone call about how you're not being successful and neither are they for months on end? Kathy, those, those calls aren't very fun, are they? Absolutely not. Would you rather sell a home in 10 days or 102? 102? Three. Three would be best. Man, that's why I like you so much. They leave for the weekend and they have four offers when they come home. Man, I tell you. Good stuff. This is probably my favorite slide of all of Chartmasters, okay? This is taking 100 listings. Okay, and what they're telling us is across all price ranges all throughout Metro Atlanta, by the way. So 27% of those 100 or 27 of those 100 are flat out just going to fail. They're just not going to sell. Price reduction or not, they're just not going to be successful selling. Okay, the other 73 properties, they will sell. 25 of those will need a price reduction to sell. 48% or 48 of them will not need a price reduction to sell. So what does that tell us? 52 out of 100 listings that are on the market are overpriced, right? In the neighborhood of half of those overpriced listings will never sell. And the other half of those overpriced listings will need a price reduction to sell. Does everyone follow where I'm, how, that, how that works? Yes. Okay. Now when the price, when the home does sell after a price reduction, they get 90, it takes 97 days and they get 93.6%. Okay. If you and that seller get on the same page with the market and the expectations and the condition and the showing access and the pictures and the price, and you put a really awesome listing out on the market on average 90 or median, I'm sorry, hundred percent of list price, which means half the homes are going to sell over list price. Oh my gosh in 10 days on the market. If this isn't clear, you say, hey, Mr. Seller, we basically have three choices here. Okay, I think I, there's a um, slide that really shows this well. Did I include it? Ah, oh, no. Um, this is a really good look at, hang on. This is worth the wait, y'all. There we go. Oh, where is this thing? I just saw it. Um, it's the it's a slide about chasing the market. There we go. So 48% of property is in the market. These are homes that'll sell in a meeting of 10 days. 25 of those, those are the ones that you you have to reduce the price to get the contract, are quote, chasing the market, right? And out of the market are homes just that flat out were unsuccessful, okay? And chasing the market in a down market is not fun, right? Because you're at 300, the market's at 280. Then you decide to go to 290, the market goes to 270. And you have to make a drastic price reduction to get back, quote, in the market so that you can sell the thing. Does that make sense? What are you guys noticing there? All right, we'll move on. Properties that sell at or above list price. If you are sitting down with a $200,000 to $300,000 uh, seller or buyer for that matter, 43.2% of the time, that home's gonna sell at list price or above list price, okay? So if you're sitting down with a buyer, 
this number one, this shows you the importance of a buyer consultation. So you can show them a slide like this and say, hey, if I help you find the home that fits all of your criteria and it's really pretty and it's well priced, are you prepared to spend over list price for it? Now, by the way, I'm not suggesting you overpay for it. We're still gonna have an appraisal. We're still gonna do our research and all of that. But are you prepared to pay list price or more? Because 43% of the, of the marketplace will. And if they do and you don't, you're gonna not get the house. So how do you feel about that? And their answer to that will help you understand how, how realistic they are, how coachable they are, right? What kind of partner they're gonna be. So this breaks it down by price range, okay? And days on the market. Clearly, this is a good slide for sellers. You wanna, you wanna be like Kathy Ray and sell that home in six days? Okay, let's get the price right. And you, there's a very good chance you'll be at or above list price. Here's a really good summary statement. Okay, this column is quarter two of 2019, quarter two of 2020, and 20 versus uh, 19. What we're seeing here is how, how is the market today better or, or, or is it better than the market this time last year? Median days on the market, about the same. Incidences of price reductions, it's actually lower. So the comparison says that's better, right? List price to sales price ratio, it's better, it's higher. Failed listing uh, number, those are going down, right? Failed listing percentage, that's also, or that's up slightly. Okay, supply down, active listings down, pending listings up, sold listings, it's worse, but we know that's because of coronavirus and the limitations on access and showing and shelter in place and all that. Distress sales down. So really what's happening? It, it looks like the market is actually improving in almost every single category beyond the number of homes that are selling, right? Now's a great time to sell as a seller. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Is there any any of those slides that show the actual um, of homes that sold it above list price and what percentage sold at list price? Um, I have not seen that type of slide before. Um, the, uh, Chuck Carr, by the way, the guy who builds all this stuff, he is, I mean, he will pull like... Um, for example, if you want to study a particular neighborhood or you want to um, have a certain, you know, grouping of data put together, he could analyze that for you. Um, it, I, I think that that we can tend to get in caught in the weeds with that. The takeaway message is price the home well, and you, number one, you can't underprice it. And number two, you're going to get a quick, aggressive reaction to a well-priced, great condition home. Well, I was just wondering because, you know, trying to um, where you can look in these different areas and get a lot of different data, but you know, some areas going above listing price, it's not important, but some areas it is. So I was just wondering, you know, well, it's, it's all a function a of, uh, I mean, that, that is your responsibility as the buyer's agent, right? By the way, the reason why you see a lot of these median hundred percent, is because you're seeing a lot of the stuff that's over on the lower end of the market, right? And median is going to take that into consideration better than average. You follow that? So, you know, if you've got a home gotcha, in the market gotcha. for 170 and, you know, they're just basically bidding it up and it's really worth 180, well, you got to do, I, I sometimes when I, when I was doing the comps and, and I felt like pricing the home was one of my strengths as I was growing the business, right? That was one of my strengths. I'd, I'd almost completely ignore the list price. Okay, I wouldn't even look at it. And I would do my analysis and try to figure out it for myself and try not to allow that list price to skew my opinion of value. Then I would come back in and say, okay, list price has been on the market for three months. It went from this price to this price to this price. And I combined that with the analysis I did without paying attention to it to come up with what I felt like the place was worth. But sometimes when there's 20 offers, you just got to win, right? The analysis that I always said for um, highest and best is, hey, Kathy, if you're my buyer and this home's on the market for 325 and all of our data says it should be, that's probably a pretty good price. And um, I need your highest and best. And you say, well, my highest and best is 325. 
because that's all I think it's worth. And then you don't win. And we find out in a month that the guy who did win paid 326. What's your attitude around that? If your attitude is, I can't, you know, I'm pissed off. I would have bought the home for 326. Well, then you should have put out 326 or more. The attitude you should have is, oh my gosh, what a sucker. I can't believe somebody would be willing to pay 326 for that place. Right? And if you don't feel that way, then 325 isn't your highest and best. The worst case that the worst case scenario that could happen is that you actually win and then you get cold feet and you back out. Right? But if you don't win, you're right back to the drawing board. Does that make sense? Okay. So when somebody says, oh my gosh, coronavirus is killing the business, the world's falling apart and all that, th that the data actually doesn't support that. Okay. Yes, we have less closings, but we also have less homes on the market. The supply has shrunk even more, right? Failed listing um, number is going down. Failed listing percentage is roughly the same. And the number of distra distress sales is less. Okay. We've got a couple questions lately about closing costs. I just want to touch on that. Um, what this is telling us here is that closing cost, remember red is 2020. Okay. In second quarter, set over three quarters of properties sold um, in the second quarter with the seller paying some closing cost for the buyer. Now, remember the seller's got their own closing cost, right? Those are like the wire fee to pay off their mortgage and uh, some recording fees and the uh, largely the agent's commission. These are buyer's closing costs they're referring to here. Okay. So I think this is a little bit better of a slot, a little bit more of a clear slide. This is breaking it down by price range, right? So if you're helping a, uh, a seller sell a home between three and $499,000, you might want to show them this slide to say, Hey, you know, I want it, my job is to help prepare you for all the things that we might get from the marketplace. I need you to understand that in the second quarter of 2020, 81% of sellers agreed to pay some closing costs for a buyer. So I don't want that to come as a surprise for you when your potential buyer asks for closing cost. Now, if the net is acceptable to you, how do you feel about paying closing cost? And say, oh, well, if the net's acceptable to me, then yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that, right? But if they say, I'm not paying closing costs no matter what, I don't care what the number is, blah, 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 you got to dig a little bit at that. You got to, so tell me why is that important to you, right? What difference does it make if you end up with the same amount of money? Help get into their psyche around why they have a hang up around closing cost. okay? Otherwise, you, you might be on a losing boat because 19% of people got away with not paying closing cost. 81% had to. Okay, here's a great slide for, oh, well, let's put the home on the market for 325, even though you say it's 300. And after two weeks, when no one's paying attention anymore, that's when we'll lower it. See what I'm saying? This is showing us that the number of homes sold in the first couple of weeks that it's on the market is at its absolute highest. And every week that it's on the market beyond that, the number of homes that actually sell decline. See that? This is one of the best slides in the entire packet. Okay. Here's another one. That, that's the number of homes that closed. This is the percentage of list price that they get. Okay. 2020 percentage of orig original list price received by sellers. First week on the market, they're going to get real close to 100%. Pretty much every week after that, they get less of, of their list price. So would you rather sell your home down here, Mr. Seller? Or would you like to sell it up here? Okay. What do you guys think about that? That was a good slide, that last one. Yeah. And if you have these six or seven slides in your in your um, back pocket, you know, in color, maybe laminated, we got a free laminator here. Let's make it pretty, right? And you and they object to something. You say, here, you know, I, as part of being a part of the number one training organization in the world, <clears throat> we have exclusive access to uh, a company that comes in and crunches the numbers every week and every month and every quarter for us. And here's one of the here's one of the reports that they came up with. Tell me a little bit about what you think here, right? We're a team. Let, let, let's analyze the data together. 
Well, I see that it's basically impossible to underprice a home because in some situations, nearly half of homes are selling above list price. That's exactly right. So let's say all the data in the universe supports a price of 330. I think I'd probably price it at 325, right? Just because that's a bracketed price that you're probably gonna get more action at. And if the thing's really worth 330, somebody will pay 330 for it, trust me. Okay, what did you guys learn? What are your ahas here? Well, the fact that you can just take that and stick it in your back pocket, you know, I never thought about, you know, having a little thing in your back pocket like that. And carry, but um, not, not, re carry not really in the back pocket. Oh, not really in the back pocket? Oh, no, yeah. like in your backpack, you know. I've been like imagining it in my pocket this whole time. I mean, if you could, I mean, that would be fine. You could. Yeah. You could make it small enough and laminate right, you're it. Like, you could do that. That's a good idea. Here, this, <laughs> this wrinkled thing real fast. Here, let <laughs> Here, this this will work really good. No, I mean, you got a little presentation folder or something, right? You pull it out when you need to make a point. Yeah. So, and also, um, where can we find that? So that's that's from the chart masters. Um, do you where yeah. do you go to get to that? Is that in tracking or not tracking the? Um... Uh, hang on, I will walk you through Lucy, the entire. Lucy thing. just sent it out. Lucy did just send it out with with um, instructions on how to um, how to find oh, it. Okay. Um, I will email. I will do you one better and show you exactly how to find it. Can you guys see this screen? Hang on. Let me go back. Uh, uh, okay. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. So you go yeah. to intranet. My Market Center intranet. Okay. You go to Market Center. Then you go to Documents. And then you go to Chart Masters, which is uh, right here. And then you scroll down to 2020 quarter two. And then you can review all the weekly reports and lore reports and all kinds of stuff there. Okay. So if you go to quarter two, you can go to the uh, toolkit. I think that has some explanation that has a little bit more explanations on some of the slides or the quarterly report. They've got special reports for in town, detached condos, selected counties, all kinds of stuff. Okay. What questions do we have? Could you, um, maybe in the app or something, just put the pages that you highlighted for us today? To make sure uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, do you want me to put them right here or do you want me to put them in WhatsApp? Uh, can you put them in WhatsApp? WhatsApp, WhatsApp yep. please. WhatsApp, absolutely. I will do that momentarily. Um, Okay, what other questions do we have, guys? I have a, an unrelated question. I'm working with a new buyer and we've been looking at townhomes and I'm finding that a lot of them um, that I'm finding on the multiple listing service say no for FHA financing. Can you, um, can you explain why that is? Yes. That yes, yes. So um, the reason why Oftentimes you see that more in condominiums than fee simple townhomes, but the principle, there's probably two principal reasons. Let's, let's just talk about how that even happens. Okay. So FHA is a government backed loan, right? So if the, if they're going to um, uh, supply the loan, they want to make sure that they are lending into an environment that they consider to be financially healthy. And so they have a, a certain ways that they analyze that, right? Um, the, and so they have what's called a condo questionnaire. A condo questionnaire is something that the lender sends to the HOA management that says, hey, please complete these questions. And based on your answers to these questions, we're gonna determine how healthy we think your organization is or how healthy we think that that community is. And then we'll make a decision on whether we wanna issue the loan in there, 
makes sense. Probably the two biggest um, issues with FHA, uh, or I shouldn't say issues with FHA, but issues with the HOAs that FHA has an issue with are number one, the probably actually three. Number one is the percentage of renters in the community. Okay, many, many uh, communities, many HOAs have come up with a policy that says, hey, only 10% of people can rent in this community at any time, or 20% or 25%. Okay, so if it's, an, if it's a community that has those restrictions, you're probably okay there. If it does not have those restrictions, you may have an issue with financing. Okay, now sometimes those are the most attractive to investors because they can just buy and stick a renter and not worry about it. Okay. Makes sense. So if it's got an abnormally high percentage of renters, which normally speaking is over 25%, then that is generally a killer to FHA. Okay. One of the other questions that you would answer or the HOA management would answer that is going to probably kill the deal is the percentage of owners, HO, uh, of the actual condominium owners that are delinquent in their HOA fees. Okay. Delinquent in their HOA fees is uh, you know, every bank's got a slightly different version of this condo questionnaire. So, you know, one bank may, may allow it to go through, one bank may not. So it's not a, it's not a perfect science. But generally, they want to see no more than around 15% of their owners delinquent at any time. And delinquent is generally considered over, sometimes I've seen it as low as 30 days, but more often than not, it's closer to 90 days. So if you have a... Um, HOA collection, HOA fee collection issue at your community, that, I mean, that's just, that's a sign of, of, of trouble ahead, right? Um, because if they don't collect enough money, then they might be, not be able to pay their water bill. They might not be able to um, maintain the property like they should. The landscaping is going to go downhill. They, um, you know, the pool might not work properly. The gate might not work property, properly. And then ultimately the communities can, can go into a decline, right? Those are probably the biggest two, delinquent HOA fees and an abnormally high percentage of renters. Okay. And the third is that process of getting HOA approval or FHA approval, it actually costs a little bit of money. So there may be some communities that just have not paid that fee. Okay. So it's really important. Oh, oh, and the other big one is litigation, right? So if the HOA is being sued for something, that could be a problem, right? So um, when you are helping a buyer uh, buy into a condominium, and, and certainly also if you're representing a seller that's going to be selling in a condominium complex, you want to call the HOA right away and say, hey, just want to ask you a couple questions, right? It's a lot of those questions on the community association disclosure. Hey, is there any pending litigation right now, right? Is there any assessment that's going to be charged, right? How much does it cost for all the transfer fees and new agent, new member fees and all that, right? what's the percentage of renters that you guys have and allow how, what percentage of homes or what, per, I'm sorry, what percentage of owners are delinquent on their HOA fees, right? Cause you might figure out right away, Hey, this is going to, this is going to be an impossible condo to sell. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Okay. All right, you guys, um, please, uh, go out there today and let's, um, let's go meet some people. And let's go add some people to our database. Um, what I, I just want to point out one thing that Liz is she still on. Y'all need to go follow Liz on Facebook. That's probably one of the best videos that I've seen in a long, long time. That was straight from the heart. That uh, was not um, overly, that, that wasn't salesy at all. That, that was a flawless message. Okay. Great job on that, Liz. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really good. That's nice a, job, that is Liz. exactly what you guys should be doing right now. Get out there and tell the world that you're here to help, whether it's real estate or not. Okay. Great job. Thank you. All right. Y'all have a great day. Thanks, Bill. All right. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.